So yes, I'm going to talk about uh, the recent meta-analysis that I did together with uh, Stephen Watson on uh, um, using evidence when interviewing suspects. And I, uh, I'm going to get straight to the point here. So um, <clears throat> I, 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 I labeled or I named this talk Lessons from the Experimental Literature. And the reason for that is that I'm going to be a little bit more uh, critical than I was in uh, our uh, uh, paper. So here we go. <clears throat> so there's a seemingly rich literature uh, into strategic uh, evidence disclosure. But in fact, when you start reading into these studies, you quickly realize that there's a lot of single studies on the principles of evidence disclosure. And what I mean with that is that it's an ongoing research program uh, that we're working on. We don't yet have a complete product. And a meta-analysis of the core is of course one way to unite these single studies and therein work towards the product. Uh, so Stephen and I took uh, what I believe is a first step towards that end uh, by looking to uh, synthesize or, or establish the different timings and their effectiveness in uh, <clears throat> influencing the interview outcome, if you will. So in essence, we distinguish three different timings. Uh, there's an early disclosure, a late disclosure, and a gradual disclosure time. So the early disclosure basically means that the interviewer presents the available evidence up front and then asks the suspect to address uh, that evidence. The late disclosure timing is the early disclosure flipped around. So here the interviewer asks the, uh, the suspect to address the available evidence and then presents uh, the evidence to the suspect. And for the gradual uh, disclosure timing, uh, the interviewer asks the suspect to address one piece of the available evidence and then presents that piece of evidence before asking uh, a second, uh, asking the suspect to address another piece of evidence and then discloses that piece of evidence and then continues on in this procedure. <clears throat> so what are these timings then? What, what type of effects can we expect from these? Well, with an early disclosure of evidence, uh, the argument is that uh, this would play in the hands of the suspect, meaning that if we uh, reveal the available evidence to the suspect, we basically give them a blueprint for what details they should best avoid, deny, or uh, uh, try to explain in order to convince you or falsely convince you that they are in fact innocent. The late disclosure timing uh, attempts to work against that uh, <clears throat> by, um, uh, by not giving that blueprint to the suspect. So they, instead of you know, knowing uh, what to do, they will have to guess what information they should uh, um, avoid, deny, or, or try to explain. And this would then mean that uh, guilty suspects are attempting to lie or trying to lie. Um, uh, will are more likely to adopt avoidance strategies, uh, which should then show in their statements as these statements uh, should be less consistent. They should, should not match the available evidence very well. And that's what we call statement evidence inconsistencies. As for the gradual disclosure, there are a number of different potential effects going on here. One of them is that innocent suspects should be better able to correct for potential mistakes. Because as soon as the suspect realizes that the interviewer is asking questions that the interviewer is already aware of, the answer of, or has the detail of, if they realize that they're in a better position uh, to, to correct their mistake and they will better understand what level uh, what type of details they're expected they, they need to provide in order to convince of their innocence. Liars, however, uh, will still remain less able to assimilate truth telling because even if they understand and, and may figure out the procedure that the interviewer is using when disclosing the evidence, they still have to guess exactly what detail it is that the interviewer holds. So they should thus, thus be uh, less consistent more inconsistent uh, with the evidence compared to uh, innocent or truth-telling subjects. An additional effect uh, of the gradual disclosure is that liars 
are also allowed the option to adjust their behavior similarly as, as the innocent subject would be. Uh, <clears throat> uh, because again, being uh, made aware that the interviewer asks questions for which they already know the answer, uh, it's likely to influence, uh, it has the potential at least to influence guilty suspects or lying suspects, excuse me for mixing up these terms. Um, <clears throat> um, to influence uh, lying suspects uh, to uh, become more forthcoming with details, because if they're catch, caught in the lie over and over again, it's not going to uh, look good for them. <clears throat> so straight to the to the findings, we had three research questions, um, and the first research question we had is: uh, Are statement evidence inconsistencies a reliable cue to deception? And the answer to that question is yes. We show that liars more, are more likely to avoid details pertaining to their prior activities, whereas truth tellers remain rather consistent uh, with the evidence. And this uh, is regardless of what interview methods uh, they were interviewed with. So when we add the late and the early disclosure timing on top of that, um, we see that the late disclosure timing increases these above tendencies considerably and the early disclosure uh, uh, timing reduces those tendencies. So what this means is basically uh, confirming the idea that an early disclosure plays into the hands of the guilty suspects and that it allows them to look or behave more similarly as a truth teller. So do not disclose evidence or think before you disclose evidence too early. The second research question we had uh, was that of effective disclosure timings. And here we look at guilty suspects only. And we show that guilty suspects release more statement evidence inconsistencies when facing a late disclosure timing than the early timing, uh, which is basically uh, the same uh, findings that we had in the uh, previous slide. We also show that guilty suspects release more statement evidence inconsistencies when facing the gradual disclosure timing than the early disclosure timing. Although uh, here we still need more studies to be certain of the size of this effect or the precision of it. Uh, <clears throat> and the uh, last question we had here or, or hypothesis test we did here was that between a late and a gradual disclosure, but that test was inconclusive. Uh, so we did not find any differences between those two methods. So again, uh, uh, if we sum this research, sum up this research question, it again tells us that uh, to avoid the early disclosure of evidence and then choose either a later or, or a gradual uh, disclosure time. Finally, um, <clears throat> the third research question, we uh, wanted to see, examine if uh, the evidence timings uh, could influence this guilty subjects or suspects uh, forthcomingness with novel investigative information or, or any type of details that were previously unknown to the interviewer. Unfortunately, uh, all these tests were inconclusive or impossible to run because we're lacking uh, studies into this. And um, uh, in essence, well, the thing I can say is we need more work. And that's uh, one of the main conclusions of our meta-analysis as well. So summing up this talk, um, <clears throat> I would like to start with some thoughts that I have for researchers on this um, and on, on our way of working towards a product, if you will. Because what I learned when, when doing this meta-analysis was that uh, we know less than we might think that we know about the systematic effects of evidence disclosure. And I'm not criticizing the individual studies. I think most of them are very good, but we do shape, need to shape up our reporting of the experimental setups that we're using, the independent variables and the dependent variables and specific, specifically. Uh, it has to be done better because otherwise we're comparing apples and oranges and it's very difficult to unite this research and bring it together and say something meaningful with it. Second thing I want to mention is that there are little systematics in how factors are controlled across these studies. There's a wealth of knowledge in there and if you read 
each and every study uh, very carefully, you will learn a lot of things, I'm absolutely sure. But we need to map that knowledge and make it more available through a study space review. And this is something that uh, my uh, colleagues and I are, are currently working on. Uh, I believe the coding scheme for this is just about completed and we got some integrated codings that are looking great. So hopefully by the end of the summer, we should be able to write up this study. And third, uh, there remain factors that have not yet been controlled in our experimental tests. We need to learn more about, in my opinion, evidence situations and evidence assessments. And what I mean with evidence situations is that <clears throat> practitioners may face very different uh, contexts or situations and, and based on what type of evidence they have available. In some cases, they may have a lot of evidence uh, available, but all of this evidence may, might be very easy to explain away, for example. So we need to understand these differences to better try to mirror them in our laboratory context. As for evidence assessment, we have a very great asset uh, in, the, in the evidence framing matrix. However, um, that matrix is designed for how to frame the evidence when you disclose it to the subject. Uh, but it doesn't tell us how an officer can make use, can, can derive the information from a case and place that in the evidence framing matrix. The matrix doesn't tell us anything about uh, assessing incremental strength of the evidence. It doesn't tell us about the reliability of the evidence. It only tells us about how you frame the evidence when you disclose it. Uh, so that's something, an area that I think we need more knowledge about. I also have some thoughts I want to share for the professionals, with the professionals, um, who unfortunately still has to work with uh, an unfinished or incomplete uh, product. And the first thing I want to say is that statement evidence and consistencies are a reliable cue to deception, deception, but I want to question if these cues should be used to detect deception. Uh, <clears throat> the thing I want to highlight is that research examines the number of statement evidence inconsistencies, not their qualities. And I think that's very important to make clear because many of the professionals that are interested in the, this technique works in a practical situation with high risk for tunnel vision. Because at the time when you're interviewing a suspect, there's already good reason to believe that that person is guilty. Uh, so instead of, of using these cues as a means to detect deception or, or, or place some form of judgment of, of on uh, the suspect, I think it's better to, con to use inconsistencies to see them as opportunities to explore rather than uh, or explore uh, alternative explanations or plausible explanations rather than anything else. And one way to do this or consider this or view evidence disclosure, if you will, is to use the evidence as a means to map the truth. And I know that it's a cliche to say that interviewing is about finding the truth, because what does that mean? And, and how would that help an interviewer? Because basically we're saying you have to walk into a dark room and flick a switch. Okay, so how do I do that? Well, with the evidence and with the available pieces of evidence, at least I think it might be helpful uh, uh, to consider those as red flags on a map uh, and that you need to explore each of those flags to better understand the situation. Uh, <clears throat> so as a final take home, whatever you do, do think before you disclose the evidence up front because it matters less if you disclose it late or gradually. That was it for me. Thank you very much.